Thank you. I hope that's not going to, you know, anyway, at least I'll see what time it is. I'm from New Zealand. Uh, that's a beautiful picture from down in Glenorchy. If you've seen Mission Impossible 3, they did some of the filming there. And um, my colleague and co-investigator, Trish Fraser, has a beautiful Airbnb lodge there if you ever want to go. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, yep, so just a plug for her. And I do want to acknowledge uh, Trish and Penny. It was really their su study, the ESIG survey. And I, I just begged, please, can I come on it? And and help with, uh, with the survey. So my presentation is based on that and, and you know, your, it just follows on from you really well because what I'm arguing is actually that uh, rather than being anecdotal, um, you know, the life experience and the views of vapors is data already. It, um, you know, just, you don't need to do anything with it. So this is what I'm going to talk about. I have to click. Uh, so just some background. We did the survey when in New Zealand the ministry was claiming that nicotine e-liquids were banned. So under our existing Smoke Free Environments Act, which was uh, established in 1990, and there was a clause in there. The intent of, of that clause was to ban chewing tobacco. And that, that is a historical uh, prohibition we had had in New Zealand going way back. Uh, it was against people spitting. So that was a long-term standing prohibition against chewing tobacco. And the clause, uh, that's the clause the ministry applied to ban or say that nicotine e-liquids were banned. The import for personal use uh, of even chewing tobacco has always you can you can import for personal use. So, so people who wanted to vape in New Zealand had to import from overseas um, for their personal use. When uh, you know, when we I, I guess seriously began to see people in New Zealand vaping, uh, and we began to discuss it a lot more. Tobacco control became very polarised, thank you for your talk, to, um, around the topic. And the majority of the sector were against uh, legalising or supporting, and, and in fact began to argue to ban these products altogether, as we had done with Swedish Snus. So, <coughs> Oh, it was over 10 years ago, um, in Smoking NZ, of which I was a member, we lobbied to have Swedish Snus uh, made legal in New Zealand as the first harm reduction product we were trying to get in, and the ministry was applying that same clause uh, and said no. And Tobacco Control also largely said no. Um, and the main objection was that it was a tobacco industry product. So anyway, a black market in nicotine e-liquids quickly grew and continued to grow. So this led to barriers to switching, and that's what our e-cigarette survey, we did an online survey, and then we, we randomly selected some of the participants and did some in-depth interviews by phone with them. Um, some of the, uh, these are some of the barriers that came out of the results. The paper is published and the citation is there. So there was a lack of informa quality information on what to buy and where to buy, um, and obviously a lack of access to nicotine e-liquid, given that the government had said it was illegal. There was a lack of support to switch. Um, in New Zealand, we very advanced uh, smoker bashing, denormalisation strategies, and uh, so the public were um, dutifully very anti-smoking and and had the, as Joe mentioned this morning, that disgust response, um, very advanced disgust response to seeing people vaping. So a lot of stigma and glares, uh, a lot of misinformation about the risks of vaping, Health professionals refuse to support the vapors if uh, they might talk to their doctor. I'm thinking of switching to or trying an e-cigarette, and doctors were saying no, I, and then writing scripts for Champix, uh, and they advised against vaping. So there was a lot of scaremongering about e-cigarettes and vaping in the media coming through from you know internationally, and of course this threat to 
to ban it altogether. So uh, in writing up the results, we came across uh, Brown's uh, stages of how a popular or lay epide epidemiology emerges. This is really the concept that science is not made up totally by scientists in our ivory towers, but you know it's a symbiotic relationship with uh, everybody in communities. Uh, sometimes it's communities that actually identify that you know there's a poison in the water, or people are getting cancer, or you know, in this case, it was people in the community saying, hey, I've really had a lot of trouble quitting and I just quit and I didn't even, you know, what, exactly what you're saying. So the first stage there, uh, and we use this theory to uh, categorise the results from the survey, is that individuals in a community note unexpected effects, as um, you've just heard about, quitting's easier and... Then the next thing is that they talk to each other and they start to hypothesize that, well, it's this e-cigarettes, vaping, it is um, leading to people quitting more than before and they're starting to experience um, improved health and they begin sharing their stories. And of course, you all know, uh, this is what has happened with the e -cig forum and they begin to share their stories. And so that's stage one, two and three of the emergence of a lay e epidemiology. And we saw that in New Zealand. So we began to have a vape day. There's a poster for the National Vape Day in 2016. The photo is from the Christchurch Vape Day. Uh, and a large online, well, it's obviously a large international community, but a local community formed as well. They were, were getting the information for YouTube. Um, Facebook groups formed. Twitter, obviously, is really important in the vaping community. And they began to hold local meetups, and um, so that's all part of those through first few uh, stages. So the next three stages is that, you know, now there's a more cohesive group has formed, and they start to read, and they ask around, and they gather their anecdotal evidence, so they begin talking to government, and maybe some scientists and experts to go, we, we found this, you know, we think you want to know about this, you know, we could help other people. But then they get dismissed, and if they are dismissed and ignored, and they have this deep sense of, we've found something, we could save lives, we hope and we want to help other people, and the authorities and the experts uh, dismiss them and minimise what they've said. And so this is where, you know, what one group does can trigger what another group does. And so it's actually a collaborative and symbiotic thing that is happening, this formation of the knowledge of vaping. is not just the scientists doing it. It's, you know, it's the vapors uh, equally part of this process of creating knowledge on harm reduction. And so they start to form advocacy groups and build alliances. Of course, we have many of those groups here. This then in this, uh, these stages also are not like um, necessarily that, then that, then that. Sometimes, you know, it's a little bit circular. And so definitely in New Zealand, we had some of the scientists beginning to do the studies um, alongside, I suppose, what was happening in the community because we're hooked into what's happening internationally. So governments then maybe start to fund, that would be through their government research, health research funds, and they begin to fund studies. But initially they usually find there's no association and you're making it all up and, you know, it's just anecdotal, we don't really know. And of course we have seen exactly that happen. So when Public Health in New Zealand and Tobacco Control moved to stop the spread of vaping and, they, and the vapors formed advocacy groups and a new social justice movement grew. And this is a social justice movement. And vapors began to become manufacturers, retailers, advocates. They began to provide peer cessation support or, you know, just support to others to, to switch. And they began to lobby government, write submissions, uh, letters, go and visit MPs. 
So that's definitely what happened uh, among the vapors we talked to. And then these are the final three stages of, of the lay epidemiology and how it ends up informing and driving a scientific agenda. So independent researchers are then attracted to, they might even be approached by the vaping community to, you know, could you please come and help us do the study or, uh, or they just, um, like me, you know, do qualitative research and want to find out from vapors what's happening. So um, then the next one is that we, we begin to build that evidence and use that evidence to confront the opposition. And if necessary, the next step, which has occurred in Australia and the US, um, we haven't got to that stage in New Zealand, is to um, proceed to pursue lit litigation. And uh, well, we have actually had a case in New Zealand, um, but not driven by vapours. And, <clears throat> and the affected community and their advocacy groups, they press for corroboration of what they know and recognition comes eventually, we hope, for everyone else, from government officials. Um, so just it's just that it's happening together. Okay, so what we ended up with now, where we are at in New Zealand, is that um, the evidence for vaping increased around the world, that, so that certainly had an impact. The pressure to legalise increased in New Zealand, <coughs> thanks to Nancy and all the other advocacy, advocacy groups. Um, and slowly more nurses and doctors and public health people shifted because they, their patients, their vapors were talking to them and, and convincing them this was working. And the government announced plans to legalize and regulate vaping. Um, anyway, everyone was doing it and everybody was importing nicotine and selling it, so they were kind of breaking the law and you don't want that in a country either. So Now, the um, really surprising thing that happened then is that the Ministry of Health took Philip Morris to court in, and the case was um, heard in March this year. And uh, the, the judge dismissed the case and so basically Ministry of Health lost that case and it was um, because they had applied that clause that I mentioned, oral tobacco, to ban the heat sticks. The judge ruled that heats were a tobacco product, they have tobacco in them, they're not an oral product for chewing. And this is in the clause, to borrow tobacco product for chewing. He said, you don't chew these, they're not for chewing, so they're not covered by that clause. That makes sense, right? <laughs> so um, the other thing that was really, really important, and I felt that he was really sort of expressing, uh, telling the ministry off. Um, he said that the Smoke Free Environments Act, which was set up, was the intent of it was to reduce harm. And he said, why would you ban a product that is going to reduce harm? This goes against the intent of the act. And I was like, wow, because that means all of the behaviours of tobacco control people in New Zealand who who, who, their whole mandate is the Smoke Free Environments Act and they, they've been trying to ban and they're pushing for a ban on vaping and to restrict it and to prohibit it. They're all going against the very act that they're mandated under. So that was just absolutely brilliant. Um, now there were some implications of that. The Ministry decided not to appeal and the implications obviously were if the judge had decided, he said that oral clause is tobacco products for chewing. Okay, well, Swedish snus is not for chewing. And neither is nicotine e-liquid. So, uh-oh, they're not illegal. They never were illegal, right? So now we have a whole lot of different stories coming out of New Zealand, and some of you have heard them, and people are saying, oh, now it's legal. It was never illegal to begin with. Swedish snus was never illegal to begin with under the Act, if we take this judge's interpretation, and obviously law being what it is, and judges can interpret things differently. But for the moment, Swedish snus is not illegal, and neither is nicotine e-liquid. The current act is not fit for purpose, and we will be moving to uh, argue what new legislation and regulations will look like, and the fight is not over. Kia ora, thank you.